Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Tony Bernardo, uh, Dean of UCLA Anderson, and I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion with Harvard Business School professor and author, Rebecca Henderson, hosted by the Centers at Anderson as part of UCLA Anderson Impact Week. We're very glad you're joining us. Our Centers at Anderson act as a hub for leadership insights, faculty research, student and alumni engagement, and service to our communities and society. They operate in areas such as finance, real estate, entrepreneurship, technology, media and entertainment, marketing analytics, and global issues that transcend borders. The leadership conversation today is part of a series of discussions created by the centers, collaborating in an effort to share expertise, learnings, and best practices across disciplines, and to bring greater awareness to the problems and opportunities in the world around us, along with new paradigms for effective leadership. Today's discussion is also part of Impact Week, which celebrates our community's commitment to creating a more equitable, just, and sustainable economy. With the theme, Power to Change, Impact Week 2021 will spotlight ideas, practices, and skills that leaders need in order to change their organizations and industries in support of social justice, economic inclusion, environmental sustainability, quality health care and education, and other important global goals. This conference is organized by Impact at Anderson, the Center for Business and Social Impact, whose goal is to form future business leaders to have a triple bottom line mindset for people, planet, and profit. The center's activities range from coffee chats with social impact alumni to this signature conference, where we celebrate and discuss cross-sector collaborations in order to solve society's most vexing problems. I hope you engage in this program, learn from it, and ultimately lead in a way that benefits you, your organizations, our communities, and society at large. So now I'd like to introduce Terry Kramer, faculty director of UCLA Anderson's Easton Technology Management Center and the moderator for today's program. Terry? Yeah, Tony, a big, uh, a big thank you. And let me just add my own welcome to everybody here for what is gonna be a fascinating discussion on leadership as part of our leadership series at the Centers at Anderson and Impact at Anderson's Impact Week. And let me just go back briefly to March of 2020. Um, businesses all over the globe were hitting a tipping point as they grappled with the pandemic, issues of racial inequality, social injustices, and natural disasters. Increasingly, society is questioning whether or not capitalism is contributing to the destruction of the planet and destabilizing society as wealth is concentrated at the top. We are left to consider the question and many questions what is the true cost of capitalism as it stands today? Is our system of leadership, economic incentives, political discourse fit for purpose to address these issues? Are business issues and business leaders thinking of the second and third order consequences of their decisions on the environment and on society at large? And what can we do to lead systemic change? What role can technology play to promote sustainable capitalism and to avoid unintended consequences? How can we learn effective tools and strategies to integrate mission-driven thinking in the areas of finance, governance, and leadership? Now, with that context, it's my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Henderson, Harvard professor and author of Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. She's one of 25 university professors at Harvard, a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a fellow of both the British Academy and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's an expert on innovation and organizational change, and her research looks at the degree to which the private sector can play a major role in building a more sustainable economy, focusing particularly on the relationship between organizational purpose, innovation, and productivity in high-performing organizations. She sits on the boards of IDEX Laboratories and Ceres and was named one of three outstanding directors of 2019 by the Financial Times. Her publications include Leading Sustainable Change and Organizational Perspective and Energy Innovation Lessons from Multiple Sectors. For several years, she taught HBS's Reimagining Capitalism, Business and the Big Problems, which is a course that grew from 28 students to over 300 and is a basis for her newly released book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, a book, by the way, that's been shortlisted by the Financial Times and McKinsey as a 2020 Business Book of the Year. 
Rebecca has been at the forefront of the shift from shareholder to stakeholder capitalism, and she'll discuss how business leaders must adapt and innovate to address the world's most pressing problems. Now for the format of today's event, Rebecca's gonna share highlights and key themes from her book. I'll ask her a series of questions, and then finally we'll use Slido for a moderated Q&A. If you'd like to submit a question, just go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. You can enter in your own question or you can upvote an existing question. I'll endeavor to pose the most popular questions. The Slido event code is IMPACT21. Again, IMPACT21. Rebecca, a huge welcome. I've been looking forward to this for many, many weeks. And I wanted to have you start out and tell us about the book, your inspiration for it. Give us the high level messages and then I've got a whole bunch of questions for you. Sure. So let me start with how I got interested in this field in the first place. Um, I grew up in England. And my first job was working for McKinsey, closing plants in Northern England. And I got incredibly interested in why it's so difficult for large firms to change. For 20 years, I was the Eastman Kodak Professor of Management at MIT, which was a coincidence, but a deeply ironic one since that's what I did. I studied large firms who were having difficulty changing. And that was fun. It was an interesting career. I think I made a difference. And I did that for about 20 years when my brother started sending me some of the science of climate change. And I'm fundamentally a tree hugger. I'm British. Um, I like watercolors and trees. And, uh, and I'd always hiked and always spent time outside in the great forests, but I'd never really thought of my passion for trees as part of my work or related to my work. And as I learned about the science of climate change and I learned what it was doing to the planet, my first impulse was to quit. I thought that, and forgive me all the business types on the, on, on the call, I thought that, well, you know, I'm just oiling the wheels of corporate capitalism. I should just quit, become an activist and, you know, try and make a difference. But in fact, it was my green friends who told me not to do that who said that business could play a major role in addressing the multiple problems we face and not just climate change. We face massive environmental difficulties on multiple fronts, biodiversity is crashing, but we also have very significant problems of inequality and equity and exclusion. And you know, one way of characterizing our current moment is we are not paying attention to, let's get technical, public goods problems to the long-term and the well-being of us all. I sometimes call that about later and us. We've been focused on me and now for a long time and now the bill is coming due. So I had this moment of kind of epiphany moment Well, I have to you know, do something about climate change. And then the good news was I thought, wait, wait, this is just another change problem. This is just Kodak. <laughs> You know, what we need to do, all we need to do is a massive transformation of the economy, uh, starting with the power sector, the transportation sector, agriculture, construction, infrastructure, no worries. Let's just get carbon out of the economy. And we have the technology to do that. We have the resources and it'll cost maybe two or three percent of GDP. No worries. And uh, I helped uh, edit a book called Accelerating Innovation in Energy. We pulled together insights from a bunch of other sectors that had gone through this kind of transformation and you know, asked, what is the bottom line? What was the bottom line? Well, one, spend a bunch on R&D. So I'm 15 years ahead of Bill Gates on, on this. Uh, two, make sure there's lots of entrepreneurial activity because it's small firms that push the behemoths into doing things differently and have the imagination and creativity. And last but not least, please, could we have some kind of demand signal for clean energy? Because here's the issue. In nearly every other industry, what drove the takeoff was either very leading edge consumers who said, oh, I'm willing to do something different, 
or the federal government. I mean, the beginning of the computer industry was characterized by the Department of Defense who bought the first eight or 20 computers ever made because they were mind-blowingly expensive. And in buying them, helped the technology get better. Markets need demand in order to innovate and deliver the products. So you need some kind of demand signal. And the trouble with clean energy or shirts produced without massive uh, degradation in the supply chain is you can't see it. You can't see the difference. I could show you two t-shirts, one sustainably grown, one not, you wouldn't know the difference. Imagine that I'm holding in my hands $10 worth of coal-fired electricity. That's about enough energy to power your cell phone for roughly a decade. So it's a pretty good deal. But this $10 worth of coal-fired electricity, it has very significant negative impacts on human health right now and on the climate in the long term, but you don't see that in the price. Right now, this $10 worth of, of, of coal-fired electricity, to make it, uh, all kinds of mercury and lead and particulates were thrown into the atmosphere, and my colleagues at the School of Public Health tell me that on average, very conservative estimate, that generation caused about $8 worth of harm to human health. Millions of people die every year because we're burning coal. And then my colleagues in economics and, and, and climatology tell me that it also caused about $8 worth of climate damage. So this $10 worth of, of, of coal generated electricity, it's real price is about 26 bucks. So imagine if we priced it at $26, would we have seen a massive transition to solar and wind? Because now solar and wind in many parts of the world is cheaper, but even in other parts of the world, like I'm in Massachusetts, it's not that much more expensive. So if we priced fossil fuels, for example, with the damage that they were causing, then that would really accelerate transition. So I thought to myself, well, this is easy. We just need appropriate regulation, get the right price. The private sector will work its magic, we'll be done. And as we all know, if we'd done that 15 years ago, we would have made enormous progress, but we didn't. And so the book is about, well, if we're not going to get that kind of regulation, what can the private sector do? How do we begin to address these problems? And um, I lay out in five easy steps how business can make a difference against these issues. The first step is to find those opportunities where you can make money and address the problems at the same time. It's what my colleague Michael Portis called creating shared value. Think about changing your light bulbs. It turns out the rate of return on changing out old fashioned light bulbs to modern light bulbs is about 16, 17%. There, by some estimates, we could reduce energy consumption in the US by as much as 30% purely on an NPV positive basis. So lots of opportunities for shared value, ways to make money and do the right thing. Second step, woo. We work out that there, there are actually a lot of things that need fixing for which there isn't a business case at the individual firm level. Um, the example I talk about is Unilever in the palm oil business. They really wanted to use sustainable palm oil, but it was really expensive. And so they couldn't do it unless all their competitors did it. So they said to their competitors, hey, you're just as vulnerable as we are to brand damage and your employees hating you if you continue to drive uh, the deforestation of the old growth forest to grow palm oil. So let's all get together, promise to buy sustainable palm oil and we'll be done. Three years ago, I thought this was the answer, that industry-wide cooperation would get us a very long way, that it might get us increases in the minimum wage, change in how we teach employees, real progress on climate. I still think it's really important, but everyone realizes it's not the final answer because it's hard to get everyone to move in the same direction at the same speed. And there are always firms that kind of wanna, wanna take the easy road. So what do we do? Well, two possibilities. We rewire the financial system, <laughs> rewire the capital markets, change the metrics. We can talk a bunch more about that, but I think ESG as is a hugely promising, definitely not there yet, but could be hugely promising in how we manage and reward our companies. And um, so I think what's happening in the capital markets is super exciting, but it's not going to be enough. 
So uh, step number four, let's rebuild our institutions. If what we need is a price on carbon or sensible carbon regulation, let's, let's get that. <laughs> Why don't we have it? Well, one reason is that the political process um, in particularly in the large petro states like Russia or Saudi Arabia or the US has been captured by fossil fuel in in interests who've been lobbying for years, A, that climate change wasn't real and B, that if it was real, absolutely no regulations don't even think about it. Now that's shifted of course, but we're living with the legacy of this kind of political corrosiveness. And we here in the US are the only major nation on the planet where one of the major political parties denies the reality of climate change, which is quite striking. So major political problems. Mm -hmm. And so I suggest that business should, this is going to sound paradoxical, lobby aggressively for them not to be able to lobby. <laughs> business should be lobbying to get business money out of politics and real democracy back in. One person, one vote, strong, uh, strong democracy. And I argue there's lots of evidence to think that's very much in business's interest, that in the long run, societies that grow and thrive have a balance between the free market, one of the greatest sources of prosperity and freedom that the human race has ever invented. But the free market needs to be in balance with free politics, with a genuinely democratic, transparent, accountable government, and a strong civil society to hold those two in balance. This is an old idea. Some people call it countervailing power. That is that every powerful institution in the society has to be in balance with each other. Otherwise someone gets on top and that's not good. So um, that's the book, Four Easy Steps. Now you'll notice at the beginning I said five easy steps. And the fifth step is all about purpose and about rethinking the role of business and the idea that profit is a means to an end, not an end in itself. And I think that's really critical, that that's the rocket fuel or the lubrication to drive this reinforcing process that I've described. But let me leave it there. Yeah, wow, what a fascinating, helpful overview. Let me start out, Rebecca, before we kind of drill down on a variety of these activities here, you know, we talk about a transformational effort. One of the things companies do of all types is when they look at problems, they first want to say, what, what caused the problem? What were the things that got us into this? This is a little bit of the, the mindset that culture eats strategy for breakfast. What is, what is your view about what caused all of this and are these solutions that you talk about really going to hit the market? We're going to have the same issues kind of happening over and over again. If there's a cultural issue, there's an attitudinal issue or something else. So a couple of perspectives. Firstly, there are a lot of us and our technology is very powerful. And I think no matter how we had been organized, we would have caused climate change and, and got into problems with biodiversity. And, you know, the problem that in general, the richer, more powerful elements of society want to take all the wealth for themselves and leave everybody else out in the cold. We've had that issue for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising at some level that we now have very serious environmental problems and serious problems of equity and justice. But our ability to grapple with these problems was, I think, really reduced by the fact that beginning in roughly the 70s or 80s, we started telling business people that the only thing they needed to worry about was profit maximization, was shareholder value maximization. Indeed, that they betrayed their moral duty to their shareholders if and to the society in general, if they did anything other than maximize profits. Markets are efficient. If you're not maximizing profits, well, you're gumming up the market. And if you're indulging your own personal values at the expense of your shareholders, wait a moment, the shareholders gave you the money. So you should just maximize shareholder value. And un when the world has a perfect market that is perfectly controlled, when there's real equality of information, prices reflect real costs, anyone can enter or exit, a free market is an incredibly powerful thing. We've seen free markets drive prosperity across the globe in the last 50 years in really amazing ways. So I'm a huge fan. Mm -hmm. But the problem is when things are not properly priced 
and you have no government to provide or support public goods like education or health or antitrust policy, when the markets are completely out of balance and firms can write the rules in their own favor, that's not a free market anymore. A market where coal is priced at 10, but is costing the community 26 is not a free market. Mm -hmm. And one of the byproducts of our obsession with markets has been that trust in government has steadily degraded. Mm -hmm. Because as we focused only on the market and said, you know, we don't want government functions, we should drown government in the bathtub. All the things that a government in a balanced democracy historically did, and that ours in the US did in the earlier part of this century, mm -hmm. that is make sure everyone's included. Make sure that your ability to participate in the society is not driven by the zip code in which you were born. We lost that. So the whole system got wildly out of balance. So now we're in this horrible moment where we need to focus on the long term and the common good. And mm -hmm. the institution that historically we've used to do that is now less trusted than, than, uh, than business, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Are the implications of this, Rebecca, that the U.S. is actually worse off given where we stand politically? And you know, people would say culturally, I, I know you mentioned you're from the U.K., but when the U.S. was formed, there was kind of a view of get away from the U.K. and we all have our individual rights and we're going to go kind of do things. Is the U.S. worse off in dealing with these issues than other nations of the world or we're all in this in the same basic way? We're seeing the basic dynamics all over the world. I mean, I'm British, right? Yeah. And Brexit was not a coincidence. You know, a lot of very angry people who felt left behind and ignored by the elites basically said, we're going to smash the system. And my goodness, mm -hmm. <laughs> they mm -hmm. have. Yeah. And you know, that, that real anger from the people who feel they've been left behind, that the system doesn't care about them. We're seeing that in Turkey and Hungary and France and Germany, and yes, in the States. Mm -hmm. um, now, the States has a particularly polarized history driven by you know, 300 years of very difficult race relations that aggravate uh, political dynamics, make it hard to find the public, the, the common ground, but the States has an unbelievable advantage too. And I'm gonna sound so cliche when I say this, Terry, but I'm sorry. Mm -hmm innovation powerhouse, entrepreneurship extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. Like I think if Americans decided we wanted to address an issue like climate change, which I don't think should be partisan, I think we could just take off and lead the world. I think if we really wanted to bring a whole bunch of people who are currently excluded into the mainstream, we absolutely could. I mean, the inclusion of black Americans and Hispanic and Lat Latinx Americans and other minorities into the mainstream of the American economy and women is mm -hmm. one of the things that drove economic growth post World War II. I mean, it's mm -hmm. crazy to have the, you know, amazing kids in districts with horrible schools and no social capital and no access. This is just a mistake. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think the US, and the US has a tradition, I know it's hard to believe right now, mm -hmm. but it has a tradition of being pragmatic and sitting down mm -hmm. and working things out. And it's very interesting. When you ask Americans, do they favor policies one, two, three, four, five? you can generate a list of policy proposals that I would say are sensible, thoughtful, make a real, you know, and 70, 80% of Americans will say they like those policies. You put Republican or Democrat at the top and whoa, yeah. <laughs> support goes right down. Yep. So, you know, we have a major political problem, but underneath it is some really common shared values about what's important and, and how we need to run things, uh, which I think could be an enormous source of, of, of strength. Yep. Let me ask you one other macro question before we get into specifics. You had implied that business schools were not, quote unquote, teaching the right thing years ago. It was profit maximization. And maybe this is Milton Friedman's view, et cetera. Is there a notable imperative for the kind of future of the MBA to really fundamentally change the curriculum? <laughs> Terry, you know what I'm going to say with that, um, but I'm not going to say it right away. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, 
You know, Michael Jensen was a professor at the Harvard Business School. For those of our listeners who may not know, uh, Professor Jensen was one of the major proponents of focusing on shareholder value maximization and indeed redesigning incentive plans so that they forced that focus on you will maximize the share price. Mm -hmm. Was it wrong at the time? I don't know. You know, government was powerful and strong. There were lots of rules and regulations in place to constrain the actions of firms. We didn't yet have Citizens United, which has essentially enabled any firm to spend as much money as they want, flooding the political system with money. That didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So telling managers that they have a real responsibility to their investors is not a bad thing. And I still tell my students that. I mean, I, I, uh, I run the leadership and governance course at HBS, and we tell our students, you have a fiduciary duty to your investor, care, candor, and loyalty. You, it's not your money. And I continue to believe that. But I think as the world turned, as the world changed, focusing just on your investors has become dangerous. And so, yes, I do think we should reconsider what we teach. I think one of the things we should teach is the conditions under which maximizing shareholder value maximizes social welfare and prosperity, where it came from. This is not some given by the gods. This is a human construct. We didn't used to run American capitalism that way. The Germans and the Japanese still pretty much don't. Um, and, you know, how do we think more holistically about what your responsibilities are as a manager. Mm -hmm. Yep, and this would all, if we were to call it something, it would be a stepped up focus on business and society. That's where kind of the future of education broadly needs to go. Well, it's not the only place, right? I mean, yes. I'm sure that, that you guys, just like us, we're thinking about digital and future of work and mm -hmm. biology and, you know, <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of ways in which we need to keep the curriculum fresh. But is thinking about business and society issues crucial? Absolutely. I mean, let me give you a, com a real example right now. Nearly every CEO I know is getting a phone call that says, uh, I, what's your position on voting rights? You know, are, are you lobbying against the bill that's going through your local legislature? And I'm sure they're getting calls around diversity and inclusion. They're getting calls around and climate. I mean, because our institutions are now viewed as so weak and so broken, the energy that so many people have to see positive change has been channeled into calling, you know, business seems to have power and have its act together. Let's have them do this. Mm -hmm. which of course, is potentially very dangerous. It runs the risk of delegitimizing our democracy. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. So what I say to the students is you don't have to agree with my particular point of view, mm -hmm. but you do have to have a position. You have to understand what's happening. You have to understand your own values, your legal responsibilities, what your investors are thinking, because, of course, a lot of investors are asking firms to move in this direction, too. Mm -hmm. And you need to have a sense of what's going on in the world. So, I mean, I don't know about, about you, but at HBS, we didn't teach, like, I mean, they had fantastic electives, but in the core, we didn't teach history of capitalism, how it varied across time or across geographies. Um, we, we didn't really address these big picture issues. It was all about, put your head down, run the firm. <laughs> yeah. and, and so I, I think we, we just need to correct. Yep, and let me ask you again, you just referenced it, the cover story of The Economist this week is on the political CEO. And what it basically, it starts out talking about businesses stepping in on the Georgia voting rights piece, which they said was admirable, et cetera. But they said, be very, very careful about businesses wading into politics. And what they basically go through is a bunch of companies are gonna um, be viewed as being hypocritical. They talk about you know, socially conscious investment funds that talk a good game, but they have a bunch of holdings in big tech companies where there are issues of antitrust. They talked about Delta Airlines, you know, that is an oligopoly and has been laying off their workers. They talked about the business roundtable making this great statement a year or two ago, and then lots of people laid off. They talk about conflicts that business leaders get into by getting too close with government. And they talk about what seems to be a punt for good government that's saying, well, business has to do this. You're giving a punt to government, that they're not having to really effectively govern. What is your view on, on the cover story of The Economist this week? 
It's important to distinguish between two ways of engaging politically, I think. One is when you're engaging with the fundamental structures of the political process. And the other is when you're lobbying for a particular policy. And, and those are very different activities. And to my mind, the economists fail by not clearly distinguishing them. To my mind, when you want a particular policy, um, I want you to legislate that I should reduce my methane emissions or that I should, um, that there should be a price for carbon. That's a particular policy preference. And that's, as I said, I, that makes me nervous, right? Because too much money into the political system and people begin to believe that their votes don't count, that it's money that's running the political system. And we have a lot of evidence, over 80% of US people, and this, this is uh, of, of Americans, this is a little bit over a year ago, believe that the system is basically rigged and, and run by the rich. And that's very, very dangerous. Um, so I think that kind of activity is dangerous potentially, unless it's very transparent and done with other firms and is absolutely in public and, and doesn't involve you know, floods of money. The, uh, the other way of engaging is to say, wait, democracy is really important. And you know, as I think many CEOs, as, as, as they've seen what's happened in countries like Turkey or Hungary or Russia, have said, you know, that we, we value our democracy. This is fundamental to a free market, to a free society. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a duty to step out. I mean, it's very interesting. And I would recommend to anyone who's interested in this issue to read the statement that was signed by 72 black business leaders about the voting rights in Georgia. Because they said, look, what's going, you know, we could, some bits of this bill are okay, some are not so okay. But what's really not okay is these prescriptions target the voting behavior of particular populations and particular, particularly Black Americans. Mm -hmm. And so this is a systematic attempt to exclude Black Americans from the voting process. And that's like touching the fundamental wiring of the democracy. And that's mm -hmm. not okay. And, you know, we're come out together. So CEOs are issuing statements together. And this is not about spending money. This is about just being very clear where we think the lines are. And yes, of course, people could say, well, that's hypocritical. Firm X, you know, is employing workers at below living wages and firm Y is still emitting carbon dioxide and firm Z. And yeah, of course, you know, running a firm is complicated. Not everyone agrees on what good behavior is. And if you did everything that every constituency asked you to do, you'd pretty much be out of business. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So the fact that people are going to say, well, you haven't done, that should not be a reason not to step forward on something as fundamental as the long-term health of the entire society. But when you step forward as a CEO, it's got to be public, it's got to be transparent, you've got to explain your rationale. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Let me ask you a variety of specific questions here to kind of bring to life your point. So, you know, one of the issues that you've highlighted is this kind of issue about leaders being focused on short term results and investors being concerned about that. But yet a lot of what you're talking about is we have to have a longer time horizon. How do you start changing investor mindsets to say, we need to be looking at these broader externalities, we need to look longer term, make investments. How do you see that change occurring? Oh, are you there, Rebecca? Rebecca, are you there? Okay, we'll just wait for a second here. We're just waiting for Rebecca to rejoin us um, here. And, um, and then after I ask a couple more questions, we're gonna get to what are a great number of uh, audience questions. So we'll hang on just a second on, uh, on that.
My apologies, we lost yeah. power. It's been very windy here and all the power just went out. Oh my God, geez. I, mean, I was on a call with somebody in Boston last week and it was snowing last week there. We that had was... nine inches of snow on Friday, yes. Unbelievable. It's already <laughs> middle of April, so uh, late no, April. I'm really sorry about that, but I am back. <laughs> Good, excellent. So I was just asking about this kind of investor mindset on short-term results, short-term returns, leaders driven by that, yet many of the things you're talking about are broader in nature. Price in negative externalities, look longer term, make longer term investments. How do you get that shift from short term to longer term to, to occur? With uh, measurement. Let's think about this. Are investors really short-sighted? Well, they funded Jeff Bezos at Amazon to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars for years. I was on the board of Amgen, a big biopharmaceutical company for a long time, and investors let us spend billions of dollars on fundamental research into biology because we promised them we would have drugs in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you can persuade investors to invest in the long term, but you have to be credible. I mean, one of the investors hate the trust me. You know, for example, when Doug McMillan uh, a couple of years ago announced a major pay rise for his lowest paid employees because he thought it would increase engagement and make them much better at serving their customers. Plus, he actually believes that inequality is a serious problem and wages have been driven too far to the bottom and we should try and raise them. When that happened, investors took like, I think it was 20% off his stock that day. Well, why did they do that? Because, you know, trust me, I'm going to raise wages and it's going to work out. Investors don't have any kind of metrics to think about that. There's not a track record. There's lots of academic data to suggest that that's probably going to happen in the right circumstances, but that and 25 cents get you a cup of coffee. You need a track record. So I think the key to helping investors think long-term is measurement. Also teaching firms to talk about the long-term. I'm a huge fan of, um, wonderful nonprofit called ooh, Focusing Capital on the Long Term, where they actually bring CEOs together with investors and they say, okay, you're both just going to talk about long-term plans and the, and the benefits for the company. So that's really important too. But metrics, if you're investing in your employees, well, tell me about your engagement, your turnover, um, the training rates. Give me concrete measures that will persuade me that investing in your employees will actually give you business results. If you're investing in um, environmental issues, the same. If reducing energy use and reducing waste is going to go straight to the bottom line, show me, tell me. Now, part of this is going to evolve naturally over time. As I said at the very beginning, this is a massive transformation of the entire economy. And investors, like all of us, are just sort of beginning to, not really, but you know, over the last few years, sort of beginning to go, oh, this climate stuff, it really could be a threat to the bottom line. And whoa, employees really do seem to care about this stuff. And whoa, those firms that have invested in this way, they seem to be generating superior returns. So some of this is just good old fashioned when you do things in a new way, whoa, it takes time. But metrics are key. They've got to be uh, material, that is to really have an impact on a firm. They've got to be replicable, they've got to be auditable, and they have to be everywhere. <laughs> and that's going to take a while. But I think that will make an enormous difference in how we think about running and funding firms. Yep. Great. Let me ask you about Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's has always been a mission-driven company. They're focused on a green supply chain. They were acquired by Unilever, but have maintained their, their initiatives. Is there an important story to be told there about what's worked so well? Sure. Um, I've actually talked to the CEO of Ben & Jerry's and the CEO of Unilever about this because it's so interesting. And I think one key is when Unilever bought Ben & Jerry's, they believed and continue to believe that what Ben & Jerry's was doing was really good business. That so-called mission-driven brands are you know, likely to grow much faster and um, likely to see just overall better business performance. And they believe that fundamentally. I uh, had the great good fortune to be invited to run the strategic retreats for the then CEO of Unilever, Paul Pullman, some 10 years ago. And, and he, he completely believed 
like you could do good stuff, you could revolutionize your supply chain, you could build purpose-driven brands, and whoa, you could make a lot of money. But I'm not thinking, I don't think I'm telling you out of school to say his senior team, they were like, maybe. <laughs> you know, hey, hey don't, don't go too far, Paul. And I remember one meeting I was in where, where Paul like lost his temper, walked to the front of the room and said, Rebecca, you don't get it. You can do the right thing and make money and we will do that. And he was like 10 years ahead of his time. He was, of course, right. Unilever has outperformed the major consumer goods companies since he first became CEO. And I think it's important to say, not because like you can just clap your hands and automatically do well and make money at the same time. No, super tricky. Got to redesign the business model, got to think hard about the business case, got to follow through and make sure everyone in the firm understands what you're trying to do, which is what they've done at Ben & Jerry's. Yep. So they hired, they bought Ben & Jerry's in order to infect the rest of the organization. And it took years, but it was really successful. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Let me ask you one more question. I'm going to go to the audience questions. And that has to do with technology and tech companies. And by the way, there's a lead story in the New York Times this morning that basically tech companies across the world are going to now have a moment of reckoning because governments everywhere are after them. And it generally is oriented around antitrust and it's uh, uh, oriented around content moderation. But what is your view about the role of leaders in tech companies? One extreme saying, you better get your act together. You better self-regulate and do this stuff. But then you have other companies saying, you know what? We're not a, a democracy. We're not elected by the people. We're making fundamental decisions. You regulate us. A little bit more Microsoft's message. Where do you come out about the role of tech leaders in self-regulating? Well, let, let's focus on Facebook because in many ways it's the purest case. Mm -hmm. So we have Mr. Zuckerberg who has complete control of the firm because he owns a majority of the voting stock. He's rich beyond the dreams of avarice. I mean, like he made $40 billion this year or something. Mm -hmm. He's publishing full page ads saying regulators, come and regulate us. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Instagram is considering introducing a product aimed directly at 13 year olds. Mm -hmm. He knows the research. He knows that in many contexts, his product is addictive and destructive. Now that's an extreme, right? But <laughs> he is continuing to actively run a model that is having incredibly negative consequences. Now, don't get me wrong. Facebook has great positive consequences too. Mm -hmm. But when you see quite plausible cases being made that communication on Facebook has destabilized entire democratic regimes. When you see what happened in places like Myanmar, where there was massive genocide, thousands of people dead. You know, I, I think companies need to step up and they need to step up for two reasons. One, it's the right thing to do. But secondly, otherwise they risk serious regulation and the regulation may very well be badly designed. Mm -hmm. So don't get me wrong. I mean, running Facebook, super hard job really balancing competing constituencies. But I believe the tech firms need to really dive deep into where these concerns are coming from and ideally begin reaching out to regulators and saying, okay, how do we really deal, that, deal with this? Because content regulation, just to take one example, is really hard. What is the line between free speech and, um, and uh, real danger and, and shouting fire in a crowded theater. And who's going to make that determination when these kinds of posts are coming up every millisecond you know, across the entire world? It's a super hard problem. But yeah, if I was running one of those big platforms, I would be all over this issue and, uh, and actively trying to really do something as opposed to talk about doing things. Excellent. We've got a massive number of questions. I'm going to start uh, posing the most popular questions. So Pranav and 29 other people who upvoted the question talked about CEOs often failing to set purpose as a primary uh, a focus of the company. Um, it took Phil Knight five years to acknowledge abuse in supply chain. How can more junior employees have an effective voice in architecting change? Oh, Two ways. First, make a fuss. 
Um, I remember a CEO who I know quite well called me a while back and said, Rebecca, you know, I think this sustainability stuff is bullshit, don't you? And I said, absolutely, Fred, not his real name. I know that. And he said, but you know, everyone I'm trying to hire thinks it's a big deal. Would you come and talk to me about it, please? So, you know, I, I worked with the firm. He, uh, he started to move in this direction because he's exceptionally smart and thoughtful person. He was like, oh, this is really working. Having a purpose for the firm, talking about what we're doing for our customers and our communities is actually working rather better than boasting about the stock price. And the stock price did great. So making a fuss is a huge issue. Second, show that things can be done locally. Now, that's not always easy, but you know, one of the stories I tell in my book is about a man called Michel Legens, who was the marketing manager for a brand of tea bag tea called Lipton, which is totally unsexy. The brand was going nowhere. This was not, you know, like a fabulous growth assignment. This was like, oh God, I'm running Lipton tea. And he sat down with the people who'd been in the tea business for a long time, and particularly those in the supply chain, and they said, we should make this brand sustainable. Now, this is nearly 15 years ago. This is way before this is fashionable. And the team cooked up a business case for why Unilever should commit to buying only sustainable tea. It took them six months to persuade their senior managers to go with it because they knew they couldn't raise the price and it was going to be a bit more expensive. So essentially, their senior managers came back to them and said, this is tea bag tea. Our consumers don't care about this. There's no way we can raise the price. You know, like lie down until the feeling goes away. Um, but they kept, they persisted. Michelle and his team really persisted. They showed that there was in fact a business case. They got the brand growing again. And that example is one of the examples that when Paul Pullman came in as new CEO and wanted a new direction for the company, it's what he built on. Now, sometimes change goes from the top. The CEO has a vision. He listens to his kids. He decides he's going to reorient the firm. But often the CEO um, looks at things going and says, oh, I could build a strategy around that. That seems to be generating a lot of energy. That's a big deal. And so if you can do things inside your organization and really show that acting in these different ways really makes a difference, that can become self-fulfilling, particularly when the CEO is being asked by his investors or her investors and her and everybody and everybody's making a fuss, the CEOs, oh, we could do that. And so, you know, we think that work is done by CEOs. It's not really. The real work is done by the people on the ground running the company. So that's a huge way you can make a difference. Another way, of course, and I know you know this, Terry, is, um, is work for an entrepreneurial firm um, where you know, you will get a lot of responsibility very fast and it'll be a bit of a roller coaster ride, but the right entrepreneurial firms, they really drive change because nothing persuades a big incumbent to do things differently, like having a small firm eating their lunch. <laughs> and so, you know, if you look at what's happening in plant-based foods and the enormous explosion of entrepreneurship there, you then see the conventional meat business going, oh, okay, maybe we should think about this as a problem. Uh, so that's another way that, uh, that people can drive change. Excellent, excellent. Next uh, question here. Um, it talks about the ESG metrics that you talked about and how do we see and when do you think there'll be an alignment between shareholder kind of mindset and ESG returns? That Are we going to see more and more alignment there and that's kind of a path forward? The existing research suggests that firms that outperform on ESG certainly do not do less well financially. So there's no evidence that moving forward on these kinds of environmental social issues reduces performance. And that's really powerful mm -hmm. because as increasingly retail investors, people like you and me demand that our investments go in the direction that we want, knowing that returns won't be sacrificed is super important. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. In the last 18 months, we're seeing increasing evidence that firms that outperform on ESG do better overall. I think that's very exciting, but I'm not sure I believe it as a general result. I think in some industries that sometimes focusing on ESG, being at the leading edge of the transition, will generate supernormal returns. But other times, you know, being purpose-driven can be expensive. 
and it gives you greater engagement and greater creativity and greater productivity, but you have to put your money where your mouth is. And so that means sometimes that the purpose-driven firms perform as well as the conventional firms. But here's the key. If you have to hold the whole market, and if you're investing for the long term, as many investors are, wealth is very concentrated in our society, and you know, there's billions, hundreds, trillions of dollars being managed by very few people, mostly in passive investments. For those investors, the risks that we're talking about, climate change, exclusion, political collapse, growing partisan divide, they are material, more than material. They're kind of close to the whole game. The ex-CIO of the GPIF, the Japanese government pension fund, biggest pension fund in the world, they own 1% of all the equities worldwide. He came to believe that it was his fiduciary duty to address climate change because he had to give returns over 30, 50, 100 year old timeframes. He thought it was crazy to chase alpha um, that is trying to find those stocks that are marginally outperforming their rivals. I want Ford and not General Motors. That was a crazy way to take try and make money because we know from the research that alpha doesn't endure. It's very hard to find and it's very costly. No, what drove returns was beta, the systemic risk of the whole market. That, for example, if you could avoid major crises like the 2008 financial collapse or the pandemic, that that is what is going to drive long run, long run returns in your portfolio. And more and more investors are beginning to understand that. That's why Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, which controls 7% of all of the voting stock of nearly every tr publicly traded firm on the planet, has come out saying, climate change, we mean it. Mm -hmm. You know, while every individual firm, it might be costly to go after some of these issues, we want you all to do it. If you all do it, it won't put you at a competitive disadvantage and it will really increase the stability and security of the economy. And so that's the other reason ESG is so important, because potentially it could be used as a mechanism to drive cooperation between firms. You uh, remember I talked about the Unilever example. Mm -hmm. Deforestation is a huge issue. And before the new administration in Brazil, the big consumer goods companies working with Brazilian farmers on the ground and the Brazilian government had pretty much been able to halt Amazonian deforestation with huge overall benefits to the planet and the brands of the big consumer goods companies. But that kind of cooperation, which is what we need, is so much easier to sustain if investors are trying to sustain it at the same time. Yeah, right? excellent. And, and so good, you know, decent ESG metrics, which will take a little while, it's very complicated, but it's coming, will really help that kind of cooperation in the long term. Excellent. Let me ask you a couple last uh, questions. One of them is on China and looking at some of the carbon footprint issues there. What is your view on that? Do you look at China and say, wait a minute, 80-20 rule, there's a lot to be done there. And how does that factor into kind of your global views about required action? So if you just look at the numbers, the US and Europe could go to zero on carbon emissions and if China, India, and Africa continue on their current course, we're still toast. The planet will still burn. So it's really important to find a way to support Chinese, Indian, African governments in making the transition. And the best way to do that is to drive the technologies necessary to make the transition down as much as possible. In the end, the only thing that will save us is innovation. That's why, paradoxically, I think the US is so important. Because if we're really going to see a transition to plant-based meat, we're really going to see a solution to the storage crisis, which is a bit technical, but going 100% renewable will require better storage. If we're really going to see nuclear power and other technologies that could really make a difference going forward, they have to get down to the price where if you're a ruler, in a, in a developing country, you can say, it's cheaper. I won't build the coal plant, I'll do this instead. Mm -hmm. And so 
I'm in favor of direct subsidies to developing countries also to help the transition. But at the very least, we need to make the technology available such that China and India and others can convert. Now, the Chinese, of course, have their own money. We tend to think, whoa, the economy is bigger than the US. But when you look at income per head, um, it, it's nowhere near. Mm -hmm. And um, they are making tremendous progress in, in fields like solar and so on. But but not fast enough. When you add the numbers up, we are not moving nearly fast enough. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Let me ask you one last question before I do a uh, wrap up here. Um, this question is outside of policy solutions. Do you see ways to disincentivize shareholder obsessed firms from seizing new profit opportunities in markets as stake stakeholder uh, organizations rise? How do you kind of turbocharge this effort? I think we need a massive political and social movement. Um, and we need a whole lot of companies showing you can make money taking the high road. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of simultaneously, we have to show that taking the low road is not going to generate money in the long term, and that it's completely socially unacceptable. No CEO would boast about employing child labor. I'd be surprised if there's a dinner party where people are saying, well, of course I use children. I mean, they have tiny fingers, great manual dexterity, and they're really cheap. And they don't unionize. I love employing kids. No, that's not okay to say. Mm -hmm. So I think in the end, we need to build a world where people would never say, well, of course I built a coal plant. Well, what else are you going to do? Um, no. No, we, that, that's why this dance between purpose and economics is so crucial. Mm -hmm. Because at root, I mean, we must build a sustainable, just world. I love that cartoon, the New Yorker cartoon, the group of ragged kids sitting around a campfire, and in the background are the ruins of civilization. And there's a man dressed in a ragged business suit, and he says, well, yes, we did destroy the planet. But in the meantime, we created a lot of shareholder value. God. You know, well in, the end, in the end, <clears throat> it's not a great way to go. And so we need to build a business case. We need to have the political and social movement. And I don't want to lose the government regulation. We really need that too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Rebecca, let me do this. I always like to do this at the end is I like to give uh, my takeaways from what I heard and I want to give you a chance to upgrade them or share your parting uh, uh, comments. So let me, I got five or six key messages here. The first one just gets into the market scaler here. The problems that we are dealing with are immense. The environment, inequities, political divide, the things that you're talking about are not small, you know, kind of elective things. These are gigantic. The second point that you made is you described in business terms that what we need is a massive transformation effort. We need to think about how we're going to do things differently, what our products and services are, the cultural change required. It's a transformation uh, effort is the second piece. You then talked about your five steps actually in your book about the importance of shared value. You talk about purpose-driven organizations. You talked about the importance of metrics to really drive outcomes here and transparency. You talked about the need for self-regulation. Don't punt and you know, kick the can to somebody else, but own the regulation yourself. And you talked about the importance of a democracy and making sure that democracy is working. One person, one vote. You had a few other items. You talked about the change in education. And it isn't just the MBA today. If we believe in lifelong education, we all need to be thinking about what we're exposing ourselves to, what we're learning, et cetera, along the way. Another point you raise is don't undersell the ability of the US to be effective here and the role of innovation, that those can be highly effective solutions. And the final messages that I got from you was a bit um, cathartic or therapeutic. And it's basically saying, don't feel discouraged here. There's a lot of tough problems and a lot of deep set reasons why this happens. Your role as a leader, whether you're a junior leader or a more se a senior leader is immense here. That you need to act, you need to make a fuss that these things matter. You need to be a role model in what you do. 
you need to be thinking about the alignment between doing right and making money that that exists. You need to self-regulate. These are all very, very critical things that leaders can and should do, and they will have an impact. Let me stop on those messages. Any upgrades on those takeaways? Terry, that was a fabulous summary. Thank you very much. I have one thing to add, mm -hmm. which is, why should we do this? I mean, this is a daunting agenda. If you, as an individual, pick it up, it's going to be tough times. It's hard. I have to think. Why should we do this? So let me close by saying what I, I say to the MBA students in my class on the very last day. I tell them that I have good news and bad news. And the good news is that we're not going to die. The bad news is because we don't really exist. I'm, I'm a Buddhist and I believe that we are clouds of energy temporarily assembled and that that energy will diffuse. But the thing we think is the self, it doesn't really exist. And you could take this as a spiritual or religious belief, but I was married to an astrophysicist for a long time. I think it's actually physically true. I am a cloud of random electrons that's going to diffuse. I think I am a song the universe is singing. And that the way we lead our lives is the important thing. Mm -hmm. That all we can do is sing the best we can. And we live at a moment of profound change and we are immensely privileged because there is some chance that what we do might make a difference. Wow. And so that's the reason. You know, yes, Terry, you listed all the ways we can, all the things we can do and why that will add up. And that, that's great, but that's all about the head. I'm talking about the heart too. And we need our hearts as well. So. Wow. Rebecca, <laughs> what a great living example you are of heart and head. I, I could tell you, I could be sitting here for five hours, sitting and talking with you about so many issues. The number of questions that we've received, um, you've done a really good deed for all of us. As citizens of the world, as leaders, I cannot thank you enough for what you're doing. I hope we can have you come back and let me just thank you for your impact in the world without uh, a pun there, but you're having huge impact all around uh, the world and we really appreciate it. Well, you're very kind. I try and do what I can, but this is absolutely a group effort. All of us need to work as hard as we can to, uh, to turn things around. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you. Thank you so much. Wonderful session. Stay well. Thanks. Take care, everybody.